Okay, hello everybody out there in YouTube land. Welcome to Roleplayer with a Thousand Faces. Uh, I am your humble host, Matt Yancic. I am the head game master and founder of Manufactured Myth and Ledger Domain, the small, tiny, itsy-bitsy, little teeny-weeny company that produces this show. And tonight, I am super excited to, to have someone with me who greatly shaped, for better or worse, my childhood. Uh, this, this man is the, uh, he's the founder and, and, of course, owner and lead writer and mastermind um, behind Palladium Books. So Palladium Books, you, you may have heard of them. They've released a few titles out there, uh, such as Heroes Unlimited, uh, Ninjas and Super Spies, the Palladium Fantasy RPG, and one of my personal favorites, Beyond the Supernatural. Um, he's also, uh, Palladium has also released, of course, some very famous licensed properties, Robotech, the role-playing game, and uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Other Strangeness. But all of that, I think, pales in comparison to the, what I would call like one of the most formative and, and like uh, imagination shaping and, and um, games that I have played over decades now. Um, Rifts, of course, which is, I would say, I would guess, and he will correct me if I'm wrong, but I would guess Rifts is kind of like the cornerstone of, of the Palladium yeah. megaverse. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, uh, uh, gamers and non-gamers, uh, friends and foes, please welcome uh, Kevin Ciambiera. Thank you so much for coming on the program. How you doing? I am doing fine. Thank you, Matt. Excellent. I'm, I'm so happy to hear that. I'm happy to have you on the program. Um, so Kevin, I wanted to sort of t start out with uh, maybe, you know, put you like on, on a couch, like in therapy and ask you about your, your childhood. Can, can you tell me a little bit about what you were like as, as a youngster? Yeah, I, uh, I, I was sort of a skinny, shy kid. Um, yet at the same time I had lots of ideas and could be pretty outspoken, mm -hmm. uh, especially when I was sharing those, those ideas. But I, yeah, uh, I'm so timid that when my best friend Alec Sinison mm -hmm. and I started to go to conventions, um, we we're talking 15, 16 years old, I, I would ask Alex to take my comic books up to have them signed by the careers. Um, but uh, I got over that fairly quickly and uh, now you can't shut me up, so you're in trouble, Matt. <laughs> no, I, I'm totally fine with that. Uh, I mean, as a, uh, so some people, some of the regular viewers might know I'm a teacher, and I think one of the best things that a teacher can do is elicit from, from their, their uh, students, or in this case, as an interviewer, elicit um, from, of course, their guests. So I'm, I'm more than happy to hear your stories, and I'm, I'm so glad that you're here to tell them. Um, so then... I want to drop a name here and, and just s drop a title in here. And I want to say the words Megaton Publications. What was Megaton Publications? So my, my origin story is really, I, I, I was a comic book guy. Mm -hmm. um, at, at, my dad used to love telling this story. At age nine, I tromped out of my bedroom uh, with a complete comic book script in my hand mm -hmm. and, and announced that when I grew up, I would be a comic book artist and writer mm -hmm. and then tromped back into my room to finish my book. Hmm. And, <laughs> and so I, I lived, you know, breathed, slept, dreamt comic books for like the next 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I was really, really fortunate because uh, I grew up poor in, in Detroit. But Detroit in the late 60s, actually, I guess from about the mid 60s through the 70s, was actually the hotbed of comic book fandom. Uh, us, yeah, us in, in New York City. So we had tons of comic book conventions. Uh, a couple of famous ones, well, back in the day, I don't know if anyone remembers them now, Detroit Triple Fanfare uh, was the big one. And they got guests like... Uh, 
Gene Roddenberry and uh, every comic book creator you could think of, Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, uh, Neil Adams, all these guys. And, and Detroit, for whatever reason at that time, also seemed to be a place where a lot of comic book talent was emerging. So the running joke in New York, I was told by, by one of my buddies who went on to become a, a comic book artist, um, was that all new talent comes from Detroit, gets work in New York, moves to California. <laughs> Interesting. Why do you think it was that Detroit was such a center for that? I mean, what's funny is like, now that you mention it, I mean, Detroit kind of had, and, and I, I can't pretend to be like a, a totally knowledgeable about this, but when I do think about like places in like the United States that have like different art schools and maybe art centers, Detroit is for some reason kind of in the back of my mind. Why do you think, what, what happened? What, what caused that? I, I don't know, you know, maybe it was Motown, seriously. I mean, we had so much creative energy coming in the movie industry in the 1960s and early 70s. I don't know if that kind of translated or if there was just something in the zeitgeist, but Detroit was a really creative place. And, you know, again, Alex, my best friend since eighth grade, Alex was much more social than I, and he would reach out to people, and we would find other people with similar interests, and, you know, which was a lot more difficult back then without an internet, but somehow Al would track these people down, and we would go visit them, and so, for example, we met uh, famous Marvel inker Terry Austin. He became most famous for inking John to Burns' X-Men. Totally know him. Uh, Tom Orzakowski, we used to tease him with because there's someone uh, he was the letterer, right? Branded, right. Someone there was, there was a convention or something where he was branded famous Marvel letterer. So he, we teased him mercilessly, mercilessly uh, with that. Um, Arville Jones, Keith Pollard, Richard Buckler, uh, Jim Starlin, who created uh, Thanos and the Destroyer and a bunch of those famous, especially famous now character. We, Alex and I saw his portfolio that he was going to show Marvel two days before he was going to show it to them. So we're in this really cool environment where we're surrounded. And by the way, when I talk about these people, I mean, we would go to Tom Orzakowski's house, we went to Richard Buckler's house, uh, Arville Jones, who was like a center for especially black artists, but, but creators in general. Um, I, I see Arv is sort of one of my early mentors uh, in, in, in books. And then we'd go to these conventions and meet legends, like I said, like Jack Kirby and, and Neil Adams and Jim Steranko and, and Marie Severn and all these people who were, yeah. <laughs> this is all Detroit, seriously? I, I mean, they weren't necessarily from Detroit. I mean, Jim, Jim Starlin was in the area. Mike Vosberg was in the area. Arville Jones, Keith Hollard, those are all Detroiters. Al Milgram, Ian. Um, they're all from the Minnesota area, if not quite proper. Uh, Tom Orzakowski and Terry Austin and, uh, uh, of course, myself and Alex, we were all native Detroiters living in the city. Um, so, yeah, they, and then a bunch of guys in Ohio, too, like Dan Atkins and uh, uh, a bunch of other folks. Um, Russ Heath, who did fantastic uh, war comics in, for DC Comics. Can I say something funny about this? And only five people in the universe are going to understand this. So recently, <laughs> so I was talking uh, to Kevin uh, on the phone. I, I was shocked when he called me like a few weeks ago and said, well, okay, I'll do your interview. Uh, I was talking to him a few weeks ago and I had mentioned to you that um, I had actually been, I've been playing riffs off and on for, for like a long time, like many people. And uh, recently with, um, I don't know if you've heard of it, but there's this thing called the pandemic that's been going around. And with that, I sort of decided to get, get the band together. And so about a year and a half ago, I think it was almost a year close to the month, right? So maybe last April and maybe Steve in the chat and uh, who was one of my, my buddies that I did this with, I, I basically emailed everyone and I said, hey guys, um, let's start playing 
riffs. Let's let's play riffs again. Let's do it online. I've been kind of doing this thing online. It's getting like a little fun and um, it, it's really cool. Uh, let's let's get our old characters together and let's do a sequel, an old and grizzled kind of unforgiven style sequel about uh, a, a group of five men in in their mid forties who. Who have now like the the world of the Earth has moved on about thirty years because it was thirty years since our game, and we're gonna have you guys kind of like strap on your power armor and get going again. Now, you may be asking yourselves, and many people are asking themselves right now, what does this have to do with what he just said? One of the characters, one of the NPCs that uh, I actually created in the game, and and Steve will back me up on this, and my players will back me up. I somehow came up with Russ Heath. And I kept telling people, who's Russ Heath? What's, what? Russ Heath? Wait, Russ Heath? What? Is he? A, what? What's going on? And I don't know why this was, but one of my players said, oh, you know, Russ Heath, like the artist. So it's like a weird cosmic connection. And I've just taken up like three minutes of the interview telling people <laughs> something they don't really care about. But I, when you mentioned Russ Heath, I was like, we got to, I want to bring this up. So you're, you're surrounded by these amazing creators who are coming in and out. And they may not be from Detroit. But they're coming in and out of Detroit. You have people swirling all around you. What was your intent like at that age? I, I know you did end up going. You went. You went to to art school. Um, what What did you end up doing with that? Well, well, because we had all these people around, and because comic books seemed very attainable as something that I could do. I mean, I could write. I, I could draw. Uh, I learned how to ink. I, I dabbled with lettering. You know, and I knew. You know. A, a, a top-notch professional letterer and, and other people and all these guys were like two to probably more like three to five years older than us so we would see you know first this guy goes off to you know if it was sports you'd say oh they're you know they've gone to the big show you know and so first this guy goes off off into a comic book guy and then this guy and then that guy and then this guy so it all seemed very real very doable and Arville Jones was doing a fanzine. We had never heard of a fanzine and, and it, it's slang for fan magazine. And so Arv turned us on to all kinds of different fan magazines. And of course, as creators, we're like, we should do our own. So our, our very first was Megaton, which was full of short stories and, and comic book art. It was a, it was a, a ditto thing so it was just terrible <laughs> and it was hard to work on because basically you're trying to do drawings and stuff on a um basically like a piece of carbon um that's, that's all you know it's, ran in i think this is really cool because here's the funny thing like um kevin and i are are from a different you youngsters out there are from a, a slightly different era. But <laughs> I remember making dittos and copies and doing my own like artwork and making comics, like publishing and printing them, like say in high school or maybe even in middle school, just by sneaking into the teacher's room and like photocopying like some silly comp some silly drawings that I made and sort of composed together. So it's actually really cool to see that you're doing it. And I think you also bring up a really interesting point and I apologize for interrupting you, but I want to like emphasize this and stress this for the viewers. I think you said something super key there. You were saying you're all around it and it's all around you. So it seemed very possible. And um, do you think that's why? I mean, there's so many people out there that would say they want to be a comic artist. They want to make RPGs. They want to write. But it seems like unattainable to them. Do you think that the fact that it was all around you was maybe the spark that allowed it to sort of happen or? I, I, I think so. Um, that and I had two awesome parents who I believed it when they told me, hey, you can be anything you want to be. And that's what I wanted to be. Um, so I just, I've always been kind of that guy who, when I decide I'm going to do something, I just kind of go for it. And, uh, you know, I, I went for it. So Megaton was our first thing. Then, then we did Night Spawn. And, and by the way, this cover is by Mike Kacharski, a local artist, inked by Terry Austin. So, Terry wow, Terry Austin, ink. wow. Yep. It, this is by famous art fantasy artist Ken Kelly. 
we again somehow al tracked him down and we sent him a letter and i think we sent him megaton one which is a piece of shit and we said hey would you like to you know do artwork for our fanzine and he said sure and just sent us a bunch of quick sketches over a period of like six months we just kept getting sketches from him well, how old nice were you too. when you were doing these things? How old were you? Um, so Megaton came out in 1970, so I was 14 years old. And then Night Spawn came out in 72, so I was 16. And, um, you know, we just kept trying our hand at stuff. We did something we called BSPS which was supposed to be about, uh, you know, animation and stuff. I was always, I always say I'm a victim of an overactive imagination because everything gives me ideas. Everything that's, that's like story and art um, just gets my imagination fired up. Uh, you know, I loved comics and movies. And sorcery. Me, I think comic books that, year is the ultimate culmination between writing and art um and, and i just love the storytelling elements uh so that was really my, my early stuff and then again we just kept coming up with other people uh, mike gustovich who most people you don't remember or know these days he went on to do a bunch of stuff for uh, dc comics Absolutely. but he started a, a, a local company uh, noble comics and came up with um, the Justice Machine, which was actually my first licensed property. And um, he came up with uh, um, Cobalt Blue. And we're working with guys like Bill Willingham, who you interviewed. Um, That's right, Jeff just talked D, to him a few weeks ago. Uh, um, you know, a bunch of different guys. And, and, and it just seemed like we were always gravitating, me and Alex, towards other creative people and, and trying to do things. And, and so for Mike, you know, I was, I was an inker and colorist for him. And uh, that was awesome and, and fun. I can totally imagine. Like, honestly, like, I think that you were, you were like, Detroit is fertile soil for like this sort of creativity. And I, it's in some ways, as you're describing it, what's really interesting is that you're describing all of these different creators that went on to do um, similar things, but all very different, of course. Um, but it reminds me a lot, like when I think about Palladium, I do think about all of the different genres that you kind of touch upon. And I also think about the way that Rifts kind of in a way is a way riffs like i said is kind of like that cornerstone piece that unites all of them and i sort of feel like you sitting there mentioning all these people that you interacted with all these times you just sent letters to people and knocked on people's doors and just said hey will you do this it has it it i feel like the flavor of the company definitely kind of stems from maybe your experiences and perhaps that attitude of just like let's throw a whole bunch of things against the wall let's see how this works let's see how that works and you seem like it seems like you had a very experimental kind of childhood as far as like coming up with ideas and you were just happy for and excited about everything would that be fair yeah absolutely i mean and that's exactly right i i was never for whatever reason um, I had such eclectic tastes that to limit myself to just science fiction or fantasy or superheroes, it, it, it just, I don't know, it just didn't fit for me. I, I always saw the big picture and always saw possibilities and, and I liked to explore all the different possibilities. And, and remember, we're young, we're in our teens and early 20s. Everything is new. Everything is exciting. We want to try this. We want to try that. You, you see, you know, Aliens comes out and you're like, oh, let's, let's, do, let's do a comic book like Aliens or, oh, you know, this came out. And this, oh, yeah, you know, Terminator, you know, robots and cyborgs and just everything, you know, just I, I, we're coming out with the Riffs commemorative 30th anniversary edition. And I do a little history in the back of the book, kind of spotlighting people like 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 Alex and Julius, who got me into gaming. So without Julius Rosenstein, there'd be no Palladium. Um, and 
in it, I, I started to list what I thought was going to be some of my influences. And, and looking back, there just this endless array of people who, who I, I knew or didn't know, or, you know, who I read or who I, whose art I saw, um, or I saw speak someplace. And, and all these people had an impact on me. Ray Harryhausen with his, you know, um, mysterious uh, island and um, all kinds of great Sinbad movies and all that stuff just resonated with me. Um, you know, and it was incredible. And, and again, I, I, I've been very, very fortunate throughout my life where I, I see an opportunity and I seize it. So I actually got to, to meet Ray Harryhausen before he passed. And uh, he was being at um, the Center for Creative Studies where I went to, and we had some kind of bulletin about it and, and we went to see him and, and that was great. And uh, I got to see Sid Mead, the guy who is, uh, Oh yeah, so, so you know who Sid Mead is. For those of you guys who don't know Sid Mead, Sid Mead was is considered a futurist, and he's the genius behind uh, Blade Runner. That's probably his most famous uh, work. But he did work on um, 2010, A Space Odyssey, a continuation of 2001, A Space Odyssey, and you know that kind of thing. And, and like I said, because of those conventions, I mean, you know, a guy who had a weird impact on me was uh, George Romero because I got to see him speak at a Detroit triple fanfare. He brought the uncut version of his instant cult classic night of the living dead. Uh, we got to see his brand new movie that was being released in a couple of months called the crazies. Um, and we got to hear him speak. And, and for those of you who aren't aware of it, George Romero started off as a small time guy. So he's telling how, oh, yeah, the sheriff was actually the sheriff from the town. And, you know, this was my cousin and this was my friend and this guy was this guy. And, I, and you know, we found this guy at, at, at you know, the, the public theater. And, you know, he, he made Night of the Living Dead on a really, really low budget. And the interesting thing about, uh, about Ramiro is that, so uh, talk about, so we're talking about Detroit. And Detroit, you would sort of typically in the 80s, you'd sort of picture as this blue collar or it was a blue collar, very blue collar oh, yeah. city. George Romero oh, yeah. is from an area where I hail from, which is Pittsburgh, which is another blue collar steel city. Um, and what's interesting is these kind of like the connection between that and the fact that, OK, we're from this blue collar city, but it's not going to get in the way. And if anything, I feel like it becomes a bit of an asset because you're like, we're just going to create it for ourselves and do it and screw Hollywood or screw like whatever, like whatever yeah. big city is where all this is going on. We're just going to do it here. Yeah. Well, and it was great. I mean, seeing these guys who followed their dream, because I, I had dreams and I had big dreams and to see these guys who follow their dreams and, and do something with it and make it, it was just all, all inspiring. And, you know, it, it just, really helped fuel my desire to be a storyteller. Um, in fact, Tom Orzakowski was the guy who first coined that word where we're talking about something and he goes, yeah, I really see myself as a storyteller. And I'm like, ooh, storyteller, I like that. <laughs> I think that's so true. And I've been sort of wrestling with this myself, right? Because um, I'm a teacher, uh, again, I'm, I'm an English teacher. Uh, but the, the truth is, you know, I, I love to write. I love to read. Um, I also like to draw. I like to uh, make films. Uh, I like to do all of these different things. And sometimes people will ask me, well, what do you like to do? And it's very hard for me to sort of pin it down because the, recently in the last few years, um, I've also been considering the act of like live ad lib storytelling in of role playing games as storytelling as well and that's the sort of storytelling that we do um so whenever we communicate with another person we're telling a story whenever we write something down whenever we you know uh we we put two or three different pictures together uh whenever we like hold up a hand we're sort of storytelling and i think that's a really yep. good way of of like looking at it like in my opinion so i i would agree with that 100% um so well that's why i fell in love with role-playing yeah because it's it's pure 
storytelling. I mean, it just really is. And, and then I'm very much, a, as a game master, I'm very much an improv go with the flow. You know, if one of my guys says something, even if I had no, I, no plan to do it, but it gives me a good idea, or the rest of the group goes, nah, 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 don't say that, because you don't have the same ideas. It's like, yeah, now, now this is what they're going to encounter. <laughs> Yes. Yes. So let me ask you that then, because this kind of takes us into um, this kind of takes us into my next sort of series of questions here. And I was wondering about you said, you know, you're running games, you're a game master. Um, when did you start playing RPGs? Where were you? What was the moment when you were like, OK, this is it for me or this is what I want to do? Because I know you um, I know that uh, you were playing with other friends at at school at your school and maybe at other schools. Um, did you consider yourself more of a player? Were you a game master? What? How did that start? I, I was a game master almost instantly. Um, so people have kind of heard this story before. So I'll give you sort of the short version. But um, I was working with Julius Rosenstein at. Um, uh, an art supply store and Julius discovered role-playing and started bringing stuff in and was ranting and raving about it and you know I, I thought I thought it was kind of interesting but I, I couldn't quite wrap my head around it and he brought in some books and you know most of the art back then and the early talk in 79 you, you know it was it was pretty bad and I'm like yeah but it sounds kind of cool and, and he, he, he goes I think you'd really love it, Kev, especially you. You're going to love role-playing. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm not really, you know, because I'm thinking like a lot of people when they hear role-playing, eh, I don't want to dress up and act stuff out. And I'm still, I'm out of my shell, but I'm not, you know, still kind of reserved and a little bit shy. And, and he's like, no, no. So he gives me D&D &D to read the original two pamphlets, booklets in, in the box and it's like Greek to me. I can't figure out anything. Um, he goes, that's okay. As a player, you don't really need to know. So he had us join this other existing group. And, and I, I feel bad because for years, I, I thought this guy was sort of a jerk. But looking back at it, I realized Julius somehow cajoled him into adding. He already had like five players in his group. And Julius convinced him to add like five more. And a lot of people can't handle groups bigger than six or eight. Um, and I think that was sort of the case with this guy. <laughs> and um, so we had awful experience. We played with this guy twice. And, and also, and I think d and still suffers from this a little bit, but it was awful in the olden days where if you're a first level character, if, if, if a barbarian slaps you, you're probably dead. Right. <laughs> so... Yeah you know we want to dive into the action and so something's coming up and we're like aha finally shh, ready for action and one of the other players who were they were already like third and fourth level would be like don't worry little little first level thief we'll protect you and i'm like i don't, I don't want to be protected i want to i want to do something and, and so they were just awful and none of us was enjoying this so we, we tell julius um that's great, Jules, but role playing isn't for us. We, we, you know, we don't want to play anymore. Um, and he's like, no, 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 it's great. I know you'll love it. He was a real advocate, right? And he's like, how about this? I'll run a game just for you guys. And you the go. rest, yeah. Of the group, yeah. And the rest of the group was like, yeah, that's great. And I'm like, yeah, role playing sucks. I want no part of it. I'm done with role playing. And, and at this point, we're all. Can I make an announcement here. I just like to say. <laughs> This is this is this is like in Back to the Future where Doc Brown draws out the the nineteen eighty five timeline <laughs> and then it skews into an alternate nineteen eighty five timeline. Somewhere in the in all of time and space, there's an alternate universe where Kevin like slams the stuff down, walks out of the room, and suddenly Palladium Books disappears and no. Biff Tannen is is president. <laughs> forever and ever so kevin thank you for helping us <laughs> with that so <laughs> so what happened was the rest of the guys were like well if you don't play we're not gonna play and i knew that would hurt julius's feelings so i was like okay fine i'll play but this is it the last time 
Third time's a charm, baby. Julius is a great game master, great player. Um, we had the time of our life. My character dies at the end and, and being stupid because we had, we had gone through this great adventure, bluffed our way through all kinds of shit. It's the classic, we're running for our lives, literally running for our lives of a sack full of treasure. We get out of the dungeon. And it, you know, back then it was like a video game. Well, shh, the door closes, you're safe. These guys aren't gonna open up the door and chase you into the world. So we're safe and everyone's like, whoa, that was great. And I'm like, Bulls. I open up the door and my character flips off with a giant sized arrow. And then you're gone. I'm like split in half. My character is like ghost. And uh, I'm like, what? You killed my character? And poor Julius, because he's a sweet guy. He's like, oh, but but why did you do that? That was really silly. You shouldn't have done that. And 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 I'm like, you're right. This game is great. <laughs> That's awesome. That well, you know that the more a game master kills you in the game, the more they're just doing it out of love. It's it's really not so much for for them as it is for you. It's because they love you and they care and they want to help form you as a player. Now, is that wh when is it that you start? like running games and does this sort of lead into because i'm going to name another thing i'm going to say palladium of desires oh, if that's correct or oh almost almost immediately i uh so julius introduces me to eric wojcik and his crew and it's funny for for like 30 years i thought these guys first of all i thought role playing must have been around forever i just didn't know about it I thought these guys have been playing for, for years. They'd all just discovered it like, like six or eight months. Um, so I, I played in a game or two with Eric. I played in a game or, 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 or two with a couple other people. And uh, Eric was a big thinker too. And so he saw the value in, in role playing and, and the experiences you have of role playing and loved the storytelling elements. And he and I become friends like that. Um, and not just Brent, friends, just kind of immediate co-conspirators. And uh, he had the idea to start something that we ended up calling De Detroit Gaming Center. And so we find this place near the Wayne State University campus. It used to be a methadone clinic. It's in like Pepin. Interesting, it's interesting like in location. Worst part of town. Yeah, and, and but I mean, it was cheap, right? Because, and, and we spend a couple of months fixing this place up. Uh, Matt Ballant, who would go and write uh, the weapon series and, and a few other things with me. Um, that poor guy like carpeted all 10,000 square feet uh, of the building. And we have all these open dreams to, to make it like this go-to place. I mean, sort of like stores and what a lot of hobby shops are now. We were just like 20 years ahead of our time. Um, so we opened up the Detroit Gaming Center. And that was amazing for me because it was very much a hothouse environment. Any game that came out, any source book that came out, somebody walked through the door with it. And, you know, at some point you'd grab it, study it, you know, look at it, you know, enjoy it, it's maybe play it. And... We got to, and it wasn't just role playing. We had all kinds of board games and stuff. Matt and Eric um, had had this big game library. I'm not even sure how they accumulated. Lots of donations. I mean, we had hundreds and hundreds of games. Um, you know, stuff that I never heard of, like like Ironclads and um, you know all kind. You name it from that era, we, we had it. And uh, so you got to see all kinds of different gaming. You got to see all kinds of role playing game master styles. And I was always fascinated with that because I'm also fascinated by people and I like to look at people and see how they do things. And so like Eric was like a puzzle guy. He, he was all full of mystery and puzzles and he had to figure out who's. And he used to marvel at my games because I would like take sort of the comic book approach and just flat out tell them what's, what's happening. And they'd be like, well, can we find out about the villain? And it's like, sure. And, and his henchman, and it's like, not only did he know his name and, and, and what his uh, character class is, they know he's, you know, seventh level, you know, he's got an evil sister back in town, whatever. And Eric's like, I don't get it. How can you do all this? 
and your games are still great. You know, where's the mystery? And it's like, I'm going with a different, different twist here. I'm going a different approach. I, I love it. You know what I so like? Was, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, there's something that you're also bringing up that I think is a shame we don't see very much of anymore. And I wasn't really reminded of this until you mentioned it and also until I moved here. So uh, I'm, I'm in the Boston area and um, I moved here a few years ago. And uh, I'm from this basic kind of, I started in Pittsburgh, but my family is partly from Boston. So I sort of knew the area, but when I originally came here, um, I was having trouble like meeting other gamers. And there's something very cool that they have here, which you're kind of talking about now, but you don't see very much of it. There is something called the New England Science Fiction Association located in mm. Somerville, Connecticut. Or, I'm sorry, Somerville, Massachusetts, which is basically down the road from me. And that may not seem like a, 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 an interesting thing here, but what's so cool about it is that actually they have a clubhouse. So it's not like a Facebook group, though they do have a Facebook group. It's not an online thing. You physically, like I walk there and the clubhouse has certain hours when it's open and there will be people hanging around and they have a stock of games and they have comics and they have movies and they have like displays where you can like, you know, you can watch movies. They have tables where you can play games. Um, that is something that for me, I mean, it's almost like a, a thing that I missed because I think by the time I became old enough to sort of venture out on my own, a lot of those had sort of shifted to online. And But this particular association still exists in physical form. Now, COVID granted sort of changed that a little bit. But I think what you're talking about actually really excites me because it makes me realize there's a portion of gaming that I kind of missed like and that is the old days before the internet when you didn't go online but you actually walked someplace and you paid like I, I pay a very small due but the dues go towards the rent they go towards buying new games and all this stuff and I can just walk in there and take stuff off the shelf and if I want I can even kind of check it out and and take it home um, so yep. I, it I mean it sounds like that was a super informative time for you I guess Oh, very, very much so. Um, I mean, that's where I, I, I honed my, my game master skills. And um, e even then I, I was still playing D&D &D and I could never, I hate charts. That's why you don't see them in our books very often because especially D&D, &D, I thought a lot of early D&D &D, and don't get me wrong, D&D &D is awesome and it's the father of our industry and all that jazz, but there were issues, <laughs> you know, a lot of games have. All, every issues. game They're, has issues, yeah. Yeah, so I hated the charts. I hated the fact that, let's see, I've got an armor class of one, but that's, I really need an armor class of like minus five to be good. And that didn't make sense because it's minus five to me anyways. And, and, and anyways, sure. I, I can never remember which dice, you know, I'm the game master and I'm going, okay, that's uh three six sided. They're like, no. And I'm like, oh yeah, okay. And, uh, but my games were really, apparently really, really good because people kept wanting to join them. And, and before I knew it, I, I, I had to cap it off at 26 guys. In the same room at the same time, or are you doing? You're a liar, Kevin CMBA. There's no way. Ladies and gentlemen, live on the program. What do you mean? 26? You had 26 people in a room with a... I mean, I have done... Okay, I will say I have done that with the one caveat that it was only during um, when I'm playing... Like, I use RPGs in the classroom. So sometimes I run a big game for like 20 kids, 25 kids, and then I'm teaching them how to game master by demonstrating it, and then I break them up. You ran games, and you're being recorded, sir. You ran games <laughs> for 26 people at a time? Yeah. Every, every Saturday night, starting at like 7.30, um, and it typically ran until like 7.30 or 9 in the morning, next morning. And uh, the games were, were so fun and so crazy that uh, we had a blizzard. And I was sure nobody was going to show up. I mean, I was there because we had an adventure going on and, and, and like a dozen of the guys wanted to have like this sub adventure before the whole group showed up. 
And so we all got there before a foot and a half of snow arrived. Those are the best games, though, when you're stuck in a blitz. I love those games. And, and I'm like, no one else is going to show up. But we have enough guys. We can play stuff. We can do things. And every single person showed up. It is crazy. That is testament to... And, and <laughs> here's, the, here's the thing, though, right? Um, so here's what I've noticed. Um, of course, the rules are always important. Of course, like, you know, having them by your side and all that is important but like to me a good game master um will create compelling situations that you know keep the players on the edge of their seats keep them coming back like stories and um ideas and like questions and things like that that really compel you as a human being to find out what happens next that's kind of what it comes down to and you really see that in like so i keep looking this way i have like a stack of some of your books here um you see that in your material you know and again not to go back and and mention it again but i mean riffs is is everything you could ever imagine you can you know riffs is in and of itself like it's a, it's a huge volume of work which in, it's the earth basically is what you cover at this time period in in you know in our post apocalyptic kind of future here in this all of that so you can really see that in your creations so when was it then that you decided to sort of take it professional because you start like what when did you say was it like oh too many charts in dnd i'm gonna go write make my own book or what what happened how did palladium come about so i i was uh trying to be a freelance artist until i could break into comics um, it was actually getting some momentum on that front. Um, I had done some work for, for Eric and, of course, the, the Detroit Gaming Center. I had designed some T-shirts and painted the sign and um, done a bunch of things like that. And um, I had uh, uh, done a few other, other things with, with comics and stuff, but... Um, so my, my game kept evolving with my 26 guys. And by the way, the secret to running 26 people is just like at a party, groups, people, when you have a big group like that, people splinter into subsets. And fortunately, I, I watched a lot of soap operas with my mom. I, I would visit, my mom was, this is not fortunate, but uh, my mom was fighting cancer. And I would come and visit her for like an hour and a half every day and we'd watch her two favorite soaps. And uh, I picked up a lot of stuff between comic books and soap operas. So you have your group of six guys who have splintered off because they're bored with what was going on in the main action and wander off here or, well, they're checking this out. We're going to go over here. And, and yes, you're kind of splintering elements of the story, but and, and, and so what you would do with these six guys is, yeah, well, it's funny you, you, you guys are going there because you hear a strange noise. And they're like, oh, what does it sound like? And I describe it and like, where's it coming from? And so maybe they find a secret panel or secret tunnel or whatever. And they, you know, they, they open up and, and you do the classic soap opera, you know, open a door, what I see, hold that thought. You eight guys over here. And you just kind of keep switching from like these three or four or five groups. And again, if you if you stop it, pause it right at a great moment where, yeah, you see this dragon and it's rearing up. Okay, guys, you over there. Are you over here? And what's cool about that is you have enough interesting stuff going on. So everyone is entertained and, and captivated. But when you ro rotate back to the guys, okay, that big dragon was just rearing up. They've had 30 minutes now, or maybe even an hour, depending on all what was going on, to figure out what spells they're casting, what weapons they're pulling. So they're ready, I'm casting this, I'm doing that. And it goes really well. And of course, now they're locked in battle. And so the rest of the group is like, ooh, let's see how this works out. Oh, yeah, I hope they doesn't get killed. You know, it's... That it's, is it's fantastic really advice. And I feel like from a storytelling standpoint, 
for all, what you're really doing is propelling the story forward. So those people that are not participating are like, wait, what's about to happen to those guys? And then the guys, just as you say, that are about to have this dragon sprung on them, then chatter about it for the rest of their time, just wondering. And it kind of makes sense because really, if you have the party split up like that, they wouldn't know what's going on with these guys. So if they're off talking about what to do about the dragon, it's completely fine for them to be ignorant of what's going on three dungeon rooms over, you know? So that I, I think that's right, absolutely right. wonderful. And, and it builds, it, it propels it forward. Um, yeah, really good advice. I, I hope people out there are taking notes of this. I do, I do want to mention, so I, I, oh, go ahead. No, please. I, well, I was going to say, I, your, 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 what the actual question was, because that was sort of like an aside to something you had just asked me. That's true. Uh, I, I, you warned me about this, Kevin, but I'm, I'm ready to take it. Go ahead. <laughs> side, aside, aside me as much as you want. No problem. <laughs> but, uh, so, so, uh, what was the actual question? Okay, so the remember? question was, how did you start? What was it that started oh, Palladium? I... Were you like, right. man, D and D, too many? I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a game with no, with very few charts in it. Or, well, so I, I'm just, I'm D and D is sort of my foundation, but there are a lot of things I didn't, I didn't like about it. So I, I, I changed the armor system to what you guys know as Palladium because it made more sense to me. And I, I didn't like that, you know, your first level character, someone sneezes on you and you fall over in a coma. Um, so I found myself letting people come in because we're still playing d and I would let them come in at whatever level. And in fact, because I like challenges and I was really enjoying this, it'd be like, you couldn't come in at like some insane, you know, I'm 15th level. Right. But if someone came in and said, yeah, this is my seventh level dwarf, I'd go, okay. Right. And some of these guys would come in just like dripping with magic items and were super powerful. Right. And the thing is, you know, if you really think about story, everything has consequences. So if they misuse their, their abilities or if they're flashing this stuff, they're going to get jumped when they wander off to go back. And the next thing you know, they got nothing or they got their favorite weapon or two, but everything else was stolen or all their money's gone. Uh, one of my favorite stories, because it was a classic goofy 20 something year old story, is this one guy who was just, I mean, you turn off the lights and you could read a book, his magic items, he had so many magic items, you know, magic armor, magic helmet, the girdle of God knows what, everything, right? And uh, so this guy is this real cocky, arrogant guy, his character, I should say, the guy was cool. And, and, Important distinction. Yes. And, and he wanders off. Well, they're in like a wilderness part of an adventure. And uh, for some reason, he's like, yeah, my character's going off behind this bush to take a pee. And I'm like, okay. And he pees on a fairy that he, that he didn't notice. And this fairy gets all upset and is like, oh, you peed on me. What's wrong? And, but one thing leads to another. And of course, because he's an arrogant guy and he sees fairies as just nothing, people learn very quick that Palladium fairies are trouble. That's anyway, right. at least the way I play them. That's right. <laughs> so the next thing you know, eight other fairies show up and they're casting magic on him. And he saves the first time and the second time, but there's a whole bunch of fairies. He falls under their spell. They strip him naked and are having him dancing around, you know, their, their fairy mound. The rest of the right. group tries to intercede. Next thing you know, they're naked and dancing around the fairy mound. You know, consequences, wiser, ladies and gentlemen, consequences. That's <laughs> exactly. It always amazes me how people don't play consequences because it's perfect. It's all about role playing. And so there were, you know, calmer heads who came in and negotiated for their friends and you know the fairies were of course insulted because this guy was insulting them not just accidentally you know wedding on them but anyways this guy his experience he went from being this cocky overpowered guy to much more reserved and when a fairy showed up he'd be like no show respect it was it was awesome that's great and i i think that's a wonderful lesson for for, for role players in general. And I think you're right. Like I, I tend to look at games as like a series of dominoes and the idea of like consequences, like there are so many things that people do. And like, 
you know, how many times has someone gone into a town and like destroyed a good portion of it or even just a few buildings within it and then they just walk out and there's nothing that goes wrong. But I mean, in the I, I try to think of my games in terms of like the real world. Like in the real world, if you went into someone's town and you started having a battle in the center of town, cops would show up and like the fire department would be there. And then like maybe some people just running by would try and stop you. And then even yes. if that didn't happen, within 15 minutes of you leaving or 15 seconds of you lifting, leaving the scene, there would be an investigation into tracking you down and then, right. you know, throwing you in prison. So... I think or if you killed somebody or robbed somebody, what about his brother, uncle, father, mother, sister, cousin Bob, the sheriff, uh, cousin Bob, the thief, cousin Bob, the evil wizard? Yes. I mean, it's, and they're going to be pissed off and they're going to be looking for revenge. Exactly. Um, and, and what we're all talking about are story elements. And that was something that was very lacking in early Dungeons and Dragons. Remember, we're talking the original booklets, which were very much an outline of a world and rules and i very much built my own world and in trying to make things realistic and have consequences i found myself having to create different rules and different considerations uh for that stuff to function so for example early dungeons even nowadays dungeons a lot of times you know, you kick in a door, you kill what's ever in it, you ransack the room, you go to the door right next door. Whatever's in it didn't hear any of this, even though you're screaming, shouting, not. killing things, <laughs> right. smashing things. They're just sitting there playing cards because that's the programming for them, right? You open up the door and now, oh, now there's six orcs and you're human, so they're not happy. And, and it just, that stuff didn't make sense to me. So I, I, I tried to create a more logical dungeon. And um, I talked about this in, in the Rift's 30th edition uh, a little bit, but I didn't realize it then. Uh, in fact, I didn't realize it at all until one of my defilers and, and uh, Palladium collaborators, uh, Tom Bartold, mentioned it like in, I don't know, 2000 or something, where it's like, yeah, so Kev, do you realize that everything that's in Rifts was in the Palladium of Desires? And I'm like, what? No way. And he's like, yeah, there, it, it is. Think about it. He goes, Dr. Articulus, who, who blended the twin sciences of magic and technology, he goes, that's techno wizardry. Level four was the vampire kingdoms. Level five was a tech level, you know, triax. And he goes through this whole litany of things. And I'm like, wow, no, I, I, I did not realize that. Um, and the reason I had a lot of that stuff in, in my games was people were very rigid early on. People still tend to be kind of rigid, which I don't understand because to me, role-playing is, is loosey-goosey. I mean, it's the reason you have everything, is what people call everything in the kitchen sink and riffs is because I love the idea that you should be able to do anything in role-playing. Obviously, certain scenarios, you know, a zombie game, you're not going to have space aliens showing up or dragons. But I mean, you know, when you have an environment like Rifts, why the heck not? And, and, and personally, I'm excited by the fact that if you want to play film noir in the burbs, you can. You want to play cowboys and aliens in the New West, you can. You want to fight monsters? You can. You want to fight vampires? You got it. You know, you want to go to another world? You want to go to phase world? You can. You want to be a superhero? Sure. I, I love the freedom of that. But in the early days, because role-playing was just happening, at first people said, oh, you can only have fantasy. And then it was like, you can only have fantasy or science fiction. Because traveler, because basically you had D and D and room right. quest, so yeah, big games. yeah, and, and then you had traveler, and that was your science fiction, and, and people insisted you can't combine the two, and I'm like, no way, of course you can combine them, you can combine all this shit, and they're like, no, 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 and, and so like when villains and vigilantes came out, and especially champions, which took it to a whole nother level. All of a sudden, it's like until some of these games came out, 
people were like, no, you can't play that. And then it, these games come out like, oh, I guess so you can have fantasy and science fiction and superheroes. Oh, wait, Call of Cthulhu? Yeah, now you can have horror too. But combine them? Mm, never. And I'm like, yes, you can. Let me ask you then, does that mean, because I know that, I know that you started off with Mechanoid Invasion, correct? Is that was that like your first publication? So yeah, yeah. when that's coming out, like, did you kind of have an idea for riffs sort of in the background? There we go. That's it. Did you have sort of an idea for riffs in the background? But with regard, oh wow, okay. So, but with regard to that, I'm very specifically interested in like, what's the genesis for Mechanoid Invasion? Like, what are you thinking? Like, okay, I'm going to start my company no tables very few tables uh i'm gonna also try and do something other than like fantasy i want to do something like what was kind of like your what was your goal so, so people don't realize if you look at the books chronologically it looks like i started with science fiction and then went to fantasy it, it, it actually isn't so what happened is there at some point my 26 guys are like kevin do you realize that we're not playing Dungeons and Dragons anymore. We're playing your game system. Why don't you formalize these rules and try to sell it? You could be the next d and well, I didn't think I'd be the next d and but I kind of like that idea. So I spent like the next year kind of, you know, building my rules, my, my eight attributes and psionics. My psionic system grew out of the fact that the original d and psionics was so bad and so slow that the two guys locked in psionic combat at some point turned to me and said, please end this. If you Let's have to kill our characters, now. we Let's don't do care. And I'm like, wow, I need to fix this. So I, I did all this different stuff. I was creating new spells, new creatures, because I didn't want people to be, you know, to know what's in the monster manual, right? So I would come up with, you know, you hear this or that, and they're like, ah, it's a and they're like, no, it looks like this. And I show them a drawing because you know, I was an artist. And they'd be like, ooh, what is that? And I'm like, that's right. You don't know. So I had really developed all this. And they convinced me to write it up and sell it. So I go to, uh, we had a couple of big uh, game conventions in the Detroit area too. Um, what were they called? Summer Con and, and Winter Con, I think by the Metro Detroit Gamers. Um, they also were the, like the main coordinators for, uh, I think when uh, the Gamma Trade, not Gamma Trade Show, the uh, Origin Show was in Detroit okay. mm -hmm. uh, in 84. Anyways, they were big movers and shakers. So I go to one of their conventions and all the main people are there. Our, our industry has never been all that gigantic, the gaming industry, especially you know, in 1979, 1980. And uh, I show it to all the big guns who are there and nobody's interested. Well, actually that's not true. Judges Guild, um, Bob Bledsaw, the founder of Judges Guild said, I, I like this, um, I'll buy it from you for $500 and a 2% royalty. And that drops to 1% royalty after uh, you sell 10,000 copies. And I'm like, I'm not giving my thing away. I'll I'll just keep it for myself. Right. Yeah. I, I'm not doing this. But he did hire me to do art. That's how I got to do art for for Judges Guild. He's like, Wow, you're a kick-ass artist. You want to do art for me? And I'm like, mm -hmm, Yeah. So um after um after everyone rejects me, my guys then say, Well, Kev, you have publishing experience. You've done A plus comic books. Um, you, you know, you you've worked for Noble Comics. You've done this stuff here and there. Why don't you self publish? And I'm like, no. And they planted that bug. Right. And I wanted it to be so. Palladium Fantasy is done, or mostly done. I wanted to publish Palladium Fantasy. And this is because you had been building it slowly over the years as you were playing it. And you've been years, patching right. this and that and there. Okay. So, but I didn't have the money to do it the way I want. I wanted to do it as a big trade paperback, you know, 250 or more page book. Uh, I wanted to do all the art uh, or most of the art. Um, I knew exactly how I wanted it to be done. 
but I'm a poor kid in Detroit. And I did not have the money to, to do it. So Eric Woodjick suggests, um, well, Kev, do it as a series of books. You know, there, here's part one, part two, part three, do it as a trilogy. And I'm like, nah, it's just not gonna work. It has to be one big, cool package. I want them to see it as, as this one complete package. So then I came up with the idea of, well, what if I do something smaller? You know, do, doing three is a bad idea. Um, but I didn't have the money to do that. And, and you know, my background's comic books, right? And I'd self-published some comics. So I knew of a local place that could do comic book size books on newsprint. So that's what the mechanoids is. I created oh, this. Oh, that group. makes sense. I get it. This was right. going to be my launch point. So yeah. a lot of the game system is in there. Um, and after the game system wasn't quite complete, still looking at developing. So I did these, these comic-sized Mechanoid Trilogy. And the first issue comes out. And I, I, I go to, I don't remember it was, I want to say it was Gen Con. We're at a Gen Con. We have in, in Lake Geneva, which was, was cool, uh, at, at a university. And I have the mechanoids, and my friend Matt Ballant has this little weapon book, and it's got you know really simple you know line art inside of these weapons, but it gives you an idea of where the blades and everything is. And again, you got to remember this is way before the internet, right? Yeah, and, and so you can't say halberd and look it up. Hey Google, right? Yeah, exactly. Images of halberds, you know, it's like. People would say, ha, the knoll pulls out his halberd. And you're like, unless you're a history major, what the hell is that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so Matt was into history. And so he did tons of research and had 700 different weapons in this. So I've got my mechanoids. He's got this book, you know, my, and I thought, so I learned a lot of valuable lessons. The trick to, to, to being a good business person and, and being successful is, learn from your mistakes, listen to your audience, be aware, watch, listen, and learn. And so for every one mechanoid I sold, Matt sold three of these books. Right. And I'm like, what the hell? This yeah, is 25 cents a box. Yeah. And well, first of all, this was filling a market niche because nobody knew what half of these weapons were. And at least you had these cool little line drawings. And, and, and the mechanoids the thing i kept hearing from people is it's only 375 what's wrong with it really because it, it was way below the yeah. market price for huh. the games at that time and, and, and the reason it was 375 is it cost me 32 cents to make right so i could sell it cheap i thought i'll blow these out the door because it's like right the cheapest right. role-playing game on the market but instead they said, well, what's wrong with it? Why is it so cheap? You know, so that was a huge lesson. And then my other lesson with this weapon book was, hey, there's a market for this. What can we do with this? Well, we turned it into weapons and armor. There you and, go, and what right. Most people don't realize this was our first mega hit. We sold over 100,000 copies of this over the next six years. And that helped finance my company i kept pumping my money back into the company and of course i had nothing i, I had no hell when i did mechanoid so this cost me three thousand dollars to print i didn't have it i had saved up 1500 and i told a friend's mom uh about my plans and i said hey mrs Lobes, um could you lend me Fifteen hundred dollars. I'll give you a twenty percent royalty based on the profit, and uh, plus I guarantee your money back in three years. And Francis had faith in me and lent me that fifteen hundred dollars, um, and that's how I was able to produce that. And then I was able to move on. I kept putting all my money back into, you know, the product and the into company. what you're doing. Yeah. That's... And uh, it, it just grew and grew and grew. So that's that's something because I I just sort of like what I like about this is um and I again I'm I'm sort of going back to something I said before, but it feels very much like you're surrounded by people that even if maybe they might not necessarily be in the industry, 
they are supportive and kind of like, ah, there you go. Why don't you give it a try? And they're not sort of like saying, no, 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 that'll never work out. And for those of you, like, this is a little bit probably too personal on my part, but like for those of you that are like listening in and watching, the truth is like as of a year ago, I didn't do anything on YouTube. I didn't do anything with role-playing games. Uh, I played them, but I wasn't interested necessarily in doing them. And as a teacher, I always thought, oh, I got to be like prim and proper. I got to do my teaching thing or whatever. But what I found like over this last year or so is people like Kevin will like respond to me. And like when you reach out and when you talk to people, um, it kind of excites and, and motivates me. And while I haven't turned this into like my, my full-time job yet, I do enjoy the amount of creativity I get out of it and the amount of creativity that I feel like I share with my friends because now we're all playing games. They're talking about like, they'll send me little write-ups for like two page documents that I'll just send out for free on the internet. Um, I'll be writing like little micro setting adventures and things like that. And I'm giving them out and people start talking about them. And it just makes me feel like I'm part of a community and there's people out there that listen and care. And I feel like what Kevin sort of described here is is sort of like the infancy of that or like maybe the beginnings of, of what it was that inspired him to sort of lay the foundations for what he's doing now. So oh, yeah. I, no, no, it is. It like I said, it's it's all about listening and, and thinking about what your audience needs and, and wants, um, and whether or not you can provide it. Um, you know, for me, I was really enjoying role playing. It was just a hobby, um, and I thought, well, we've got something cooking here, especially when weapons and armors took off. Um, so I said, hey, this is a great temporary thing until I break into comics. It was never supposed to be a full-time thing. Right. It was just something to get you through those those lean years until you were, you know broke out as a comic artist. Yeah. And everything started to take off. And the next thing I know, I, I Palladium is my my full-time job. In fact, when I when I met my 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 wife uh, at the time, um, you know, we're planning on getting married, and this is. Uh, uh, like, like 1983 and uh, you know she's making more as a uh, data processing person than, than I'm making busting my ass trying to get all these books out and, and I said you know but if everything goes the way it, it looks like you know I'm looking at my, my three-year plan here um, you know in, in two years I should be pulling down you know ninety thousand dollars a year and she kisses me on the cheek and says, I'll marry you anyway, because she didn't think that would be possible, right? Right. Three years later, I'm pulling down $92,000 personally, not the company, personally. Um, and uh, we're off to the races. So, uh, so, what's, so what's interesting is you start out and now see, when I first heard of Palladium, um, What's interesting to me is that you had these, you had your own original properties that you created. And, mm -hmm. um, but somehow, like I first heard of Palladium through Robotech, okay? Because as a little kid, like I, uh, when I was like 10 or 11, I think I watched Robotech uh, with the, the Harmony Gold version. And I'm yeah. walking through Comics Plus in Holyoke, Massachusetts and sitting on the shelf for nine ninety five, what you know <laughs> money i had scraped together over several weeks of like you know yeah. working at the you know the farm next door to the, the house where i'm living or whatever is robotech the role-playing game and up until that point i had not really felt comfortable when i was a kid with rule sets and numbers and things like that but i was such a robotech fan i decided and I sat in my dad, my dad drove me home and the, and the Holyoke Mall was like a 45 minute ride, right? So I sat in the back, ignored my father, and I started with literally like page one. And I just read from beginning to end with like a pencil taking notes. And I was determined that despite the fact that I'd never been able to sort of learn RPGs or Game Master or anything, I loved Robotech so much I was going to learn it. And after doing that, of course, What's great about having done that as a kid is that once you know one Palladium, you know, game, for the most part, 
to 95%, you know all of them, most of them. And so what that allowed me to do was then people are, I was like, okay, well, who did this Robotech game? How did this come up? Palladium or Palladium? Maybe I probably said yeah. Pal Palladium. What's Palladium? <laughs> and I, and I found the other, the other things. I like went out there and how did, how did you go from the, how did you like beat TSR to like a Robotech or TMNT and get it? And also how was it that like you managed to sort of balance how did how did you manage to like approach designing something where it sounds like you had your your background to draw on to build like the fantasy rpg and then also your other games which you're probably making up in your head and you probably have a background with them and familiar but what was it like working on a property versus and how did you get it in the first place yeah so th th those are great questions um to no, 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 they're, they're, they're great. Um, so it didn't feel like it at the time, but but being poor and starting quite literally from the ground up was awesome learning experience because you had to make calculated risks. You had to learn everything from from every you know shipping and advertising and distribution and all that stuff you you, you have to learn there was no one to, to tell you about it um you had to learn from your mistakes um you know and, and and necessity is the mother of invention so why did we do soft cover perfect bound eight and a half by 11 books it was new technology no one else was doing it. And it was a simple matter of, at the time, a hardcover would cost me five or six bucks to make. That soft cover book cost me a buck 25. I could swing a buck 25 each. And I could swing it six. at 12 years old. I well, and the thing is, 9.95, sure. Because I, because I grew up poor and, and, and I suffered through okay, I want these 20 books because everything inflames my imagination and I want these 20 books, but I can only afford two. So when I created my, my games, I deliberately wanted to keep them at a price point that people could afford that had a low price of entry. Um, I also wanted to give them books that were visually powerful um, so when they looked at it, they'd go, holy crap, like you, this is Robotech. I recognize this. There's these big, beautiful full page illustrations. There's the complete stats for every mech that I ever loved. Um, same thing of Ninja Turtles, because Ninja Turtles came first. Um, we got Ninja Turtles in uh, 85 and we did Robotech in 86. And what, what happened with, with Turtles is you know, my, my comic book background. So I had heard about this hot new independent comic book, TMNT, and I, I could not get a copy of issue number one to save my life. That's but true. Issue number Even today, it's tough. Now, the only reason I have one, Kevin East, bless his heart, he, uh, he had a couple extra copies and he knew I loved it and could never find it. And he one year he saint. just sent me a copy. Oh my goodness. Book. He is. He's a sweetheart. Um, by the way, the success of Ninja Turtles could not happen to nicer beings. Th those guys are just the greatest. Anyway, um, I finally got a copy of TMNT number two. And I got done reading it. And I put it down and I turned to my wife and I go, Marianne, this would make a great role playing game. Especially if they let us create every type of, of, of mutant animal. And Freelander calls me up and says, Kevin, TMNT, I think you make a great role playing game. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I do too. And, and in fact, he had a shot at, at writing it, but it failed miserably. And uh, uh, Eric Woodjick took over and of course turned out a masterpiece. Um, so, so we had TMNT and then, uh, and, and that was a smash hit. And that was scary, uh, actually, because we had a good little company going. We had some successes 
and, and really, I think part of the secret to my success is I was, I was too stupid to fail. I, I had what people of the time probably would have thought were unrealistic expectations. So my background is comic books. So I'm thinking to have a successful company, I need to be producing games that I'm selling, you know, 100,000, 200,000 copies. And, you know, well, crap, only sold 6,000. This only sold 10,000. I got to bust my ass and do better. Right. So with Ninja Turtles, it was scary because, well, Kevin Pete, they were as green as green could be. When I, when I finally spoke to them, uh, they were so green that they said, Kev, we don't know nothing about contracts. Why don't you drop the contract? You know, and I'm green too, right? And I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> fake it, fake it till you make it. It's true. Yeah, why not? I, it's got to be a first so, time for everything. <laughs> yeah. So I, I write, I write up the contract. Um, you know, they sign it. I get them, of course, to do art work, and I, I know my market. So first of all. The $9.99 price point, I needed something where I'm going to make money, but comic book collectors are going to look at this and say, eh, you know, at the time, it's like five times what a typical comic book yeah, is and for. but But you know what? For the Ninja Turtles, those were independent, and those were a little bit higher. So it was actually, it was even closer. Like a Marvel comic, I think think was like 65 75 cents but like a, a mirage comic was a, a, maybe a couple bucks or three bucks i don't know yep. i'm sure they'll correct me in the chat if i'm wrong but um yeah i think it was like <laughs> sure. two or three bucks so it wasn't that much more expensive when you think about it well and it, it's you know i made sure that that kevin pete gave me uh, i forget if it was 10 or 12 page original comic strip in it they did all the art um kevin eastman did the cover which I didn't know until about 10 years ago that that was the first painting he had ever done. Um, they, they were pretty funny because they were like, Kevin, we don't understand. We seem to be doing our best work for you. And I'm like, well, that's great. And they're like, well, yeah, for you, why aren't we doing our best work for us? And I'm like, <laughs> but I'm like, but, but you are, I mean, it's great stuff. But it's true, like the t those two. Okay, so first of all, I just want to say I'm I love the others, uh, your 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 properties. I do. That's my mainstay, right? Riffs. Everybody knows this. You can talk to my buddies. But here's the thing: the thing that got me into the store and got me to pick it up was was TMNT and of course Robotech, which was the the real one yeah. for me. Now the. So, the well, I was going to say is the reason I, I kind of go off on a tangent with Turtles is because that was our first big experiment with a license. And, and what I always feel, there are only three reasons to get a, for anyone to get a license. You love it. It's going to open up doors for you. And it's going to make you a pile of money if you do it right. Any one of those is a good reason to get a license. In the case of Turtles and Robotech, they were all three. So they were like a match made in heaven. And um, the challenge with doing uh, a property like that is you, you really need to know it and love it and understand what the market wants. Because just because something's a big hit doesn't mean it's going to sell. Uh, a lot of people seem to think that well, it's that rain, name recognition that um, is going to rein people in. And, and, and that's only true to a point that, that name recognition in, in your story about Robotech is per, a perfect example. You knew Robotech, you loved Robotech, you saw there was some kind of a game, the cover looked really cool, you picked it up, and the name Robotech is what made you pick it up. <coughs> but what kept you playing the game and discovering the rest of our games is that that book delivered. It gave you what, what it took Hollywood forever on, until the Sam Raimi Spider-Mans to realize if you're loyal to the fan base, the fan base will embrace you. Yes, that, that is exactly where I was going with this. And that is what I kind of wanted to sort of say. 
I, I have a million things that I picked up when I was 11 or 12. Very few of them do I keep here sitting at my desk or back on my shelves and do I take off the shelf? Because I do have an affection for like something I bought when I was 12. And I look at it and I say, oh, this is pretty cool. But there are very few products or, or things or items that I can pick up. And I know when I look at like, you know, maybe the armor of the Veritech, I know that it's like, it's now like canon and it's pretty much considered to be exactly the way that it is. And I know I can pick up Ninja Turtles and I know that I can think about, well, how am I, if I'm gonna do like a like an animal design, like a mutant animal for my game, how would I approach this? Oh, I know, I'll go to like the bio, bio system and I'll start looking about like things like that and how I can mutate my animal. And I may like tear, you know, rules out of that. Or I might just say, you know what, let's play Ninja Turtles and other strangeness tonight because that's like why bother like modifying it when it's already there and i think right that's why if you that's why everybody if, if you go to ebay and you look at ebay these things are like like ninja turtles a copy of ninja turtles will set you back because people are still looking for it people still want it people are still like demanding it and it's still honestly stands up and so kevin did not pay me to say that and i've said this all the time the way i choose my guests is based on what i have on my shelves right so uh i, I bring on people that i i want to talk to and ninja turtles and robotech are still on my shelf because of that and you know maybe probably most of all riffs is on my shelf and like all of those things are there because they have some sort of enduring power they they continue to go on and what's funny is i know that you know you no longer have the licenses on on ninja turtles and robotech but in some ways i was going to sort of get into this what's funny is that of course i first pick up pa palladium books uh just for like <laughs> robotech and tmnt but not long thereafter there's this thing called riffs like what is riffs and we're pretty soon all of us at like school and high school have got like a copy of riffs and we're all like taking a look at it and then more of them are coming out um what made you kind of make the leap to riffs and and like did you have an idea like okay this is going to be like this is going to be my flagship this is going to be like my endurance this is the start of my megaverse or was it just like oh, i'm going to do riffs now <laughs> that's a lot um no I, I i i well for me at the time it was supposed to be my magnum opus it was going to be my star wars um, one of the things I had battled early on, like the original Palladium Fantasy book, it, as good as it is, as well loved as it is, um, I, 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 I really wanted to go with a very specific world. And, and again, we're talking the early days of role playing. So everyone's like, no, 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 it's got to be generic. I mean, just like D&D &D is a generic Lord of the Rings. And, and you know, Traveler is just sort of a culmination of, you know, various science fiction space opera. And, and and I'm like, so I come out with turtles. And it's a smash hit. Like I said, it was scary because we printed ten thousand copies. It was a lot of money for us. It was the most initial print run we had ever done. We typically oh, did wow. five or six thousand. Yeah, wow. And it's someone else's world, right? And and while we thought we were totally cool with it and we had really captured it. It, it's you, you don't know you don't know how the fan base is going to react you don't know and uh we sold out tens of copies in three months and we were like yes we did it this is great then I, well i gotta give you a, a great robotech story because as a robotech fan you'll love this please so yeah absolutely i had been developing my my mdc my mega damage system and uh, I was originally going to put it into the mechanoids, uh, a new version of the mechanoids. And, and this, this uh, one of my employees and friend, uh, Richard Burke, uh, who I slipped into his character in, into the game. And then what was cool about that is um, McKinney, the guy who was writing a novel, which is actually two guys, by the way. McKinney, yeah, that Jack McKinney, that's right. Yeah, J Jack McKinney, it was actually two people. 
uh, nice guys, and, and they were using our books as, as like the like canon because right there was like yeah this is before the internet or the internet's just kind of taking off, and, and you can get this information. And we we had uh, um, we we took Memory Perfect, which was this big book on Robotech or Macross, I should say. That's right. We had a yeah. Winston University professor translate the pages, and, and that was crazy. Because like we're like okay, how many missiles is carried by by a Veritech or this or that, and the translation would be many, or well, many many missiles. This okay. is a bit of a return to a joke, but uh, I would just like to point out that when Kevin brings up. Uh, missiles. He's also said things like, "I don't like tables in in my games." But uh, I would like oh. <laughs> to respectfully kind of uh, kind of make a little bit of a, a little joke here. I think Kevin knows where I'm going with this. I think you do. But I'd like to say for the second time tonight, I've proven Kevin Cambieta a liar. There is a table <laughs> of missiles of missiles, <laughs> sir. How how do you respond? Don't wait for the translation. Tell me now. It's really more of a list. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Touche. Touche. You have me there, sir. Please continue. Well, so 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 we had to. We rented the well. We we bought the 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 videotapes, and I had to buy at the time what was like state of the art uh, VHS player. That could freeze frames. That cost me nine hundred and fifty bucks, you know, nineteen eighty six dollars, and we would freeze frames and count the damn missiles, and, and, and to make sure so we could figure out how many there were. But the the, the part of the story that, that you'll you'll really like is, so Richard Burke is telling me there's a show Robotech. It's awesome. It's incredible. It's like perfect for your mega for for your uh, mega damage system that you want to you want to introduce and i'm like yeah okay and he's like but but it's on at 4 a.m in the morning but it's that's right it was really yeah. and, and i'm like yeah and it's funny i was a night person i was usually up i, I would go to bed around four in the morning but i i never watched the show right and, and rick is on me for like six months going gavin you got you're killing me you gotta watch robotech and finally, it switches like four in the afternoon, and I'm sitting there, and it's I, I catch it like in the middle of the episodes where it's the episode where there's Entrati rain down hell on Earth, mm -hmm. and there's yeah. this great scene where you've got like a National Guard or Army guy, you know, leaning over talking to a girl who's like handing him a flower, and he's like, "Hi, little girl, what's your name?" Boom, and they're atomized. Yes, there was violence. Yeah. I'm like, "What is this?" <laughs> And, and the fight scenes were amazing in the Mecca. Yeah, and I turned to Rick yeah. Burke and I go, why didn't you tell me this is a great anime? And he's like, I've been telling you for six months. Goes, no, you, you needed to be more forceful. You weren't listening, Kevin. So, so we reached out, we reach out to Harmony Gold. I know you're right. I wasn't, I wasn't listening. And uh, we reach out. I, I'm an instant fan of Robotech. I start buying everything I can. I catch all kinds of episodes. I reach out to Harmony Gold. I give him this big pitch. I don't even let the guy talk, right? And I get done and he goes, wow, that was one of the, the best pitches I, I've ever heard. I would love to give you this license. And I'm like, yes. He says, except I can't. I knew this was coming. Let me guess. And I'm oh, like, well, what, do you mean, what do you mean you can't? He goes, We've been negotiating with Steve Jackson Games for the last three months. Oh. I expect to get a signed contract from them this afternoon. Double O. Wow. Yeah. So I'm like, oh. I, I mean, I'm crestfallen. And, and I say, uh, well, you know, if if the deal falls through, um, you don't get, get, get yeah. give me a call. And, and he's like, Kevin, it's, it's not going to fall through. I mean, we've ironed out the contract. I'm expecting to get the signed thing. And I hang up the phone and I'm just stomping around the kitchen, you know, screaming at myself, what a 
fool. Why didn't I listen to Rick? Why didn't I contact them six months ago? And Marianne turns to me and goes, I don't know. I just have a feeling you're going to get this license. And I'm like, you're so full of it. You know, I blew no, this. No way. This, this, yeah. Three hours later, I get a call and he says, you won't believe this, but uh, the, the, the Steve Jackson deal fell through. I go, it did. And he goes, yeah, apparently the guy I was dealing with, Ray Greer, didn't have the authority to finalize the deal. And Steve Jackson, oh, no kidding. The license amount was too much. So if you want it, let's talk. And I'm like, if I want it, of course I want it. And, and that was funny because, uh, um, you know, the guy asked me to see not just our books, but he wants to see what we've done of other licensed properties. And I'm like, well, I only have two licensed property, Justice right. Mission, which doesn't look so good because it wasn't actually typeset. It was on a, actually rubber uh, turtles too. The original turtles. Again, we, you right. know, we're growing, right? So I, uh, you know, we, we were making the, the typesetting. None of that was actually typeset. We, we typed it on a brother's typewriter because it kind of looked like typesetting. Right. And, and so I'm like, I send them the two things, the only two licenses I have. And he's like, yeah, these look great. <laughs> That's awesome. That... And, uh, and we got the license. That's amazing because like I would have figured people would be kind of like, fighting over it i mean i don't know because i'm i'm trying to remember through the lens of the eight nine ten year old me and you're right i do remember like i never knew what robotech was because it was on at some odd hour of the morning and then eventually i think they ran it later on i think they bumped it to like six uh, maybe seven or seven thirty where I could watch it just before I hopped on the bus. And then I think later it went to afternoons. So like, it's kind of weird that this thing that we now sort of, you know, everybody knows Robotech, uh, any, any RPG yeah. ears, comic book fans know Robotech. Um, anybody that knows that usually also knows Macross and like the, how they're connected and all of that stuff. And the story of Harmony Gold and, and, and um, Studio New, I think it is, if I'm, I hope I'm getting that right, that, that owns it or one of them. So, What's interesting, though, is that people wouldn't be fighting over it. And it's cool that you would sort of identify it and jump on it and try to grab it. Um, and and with that, you end up, in my mind, again, creating a fantastic, if nothing else, if nothing else, and if it's, it is more than just that, but if it were nothing else, it would be an amazing reference manual or or just something you right. can sit there and read all day long because there's so many interesting things like you know like i remember being blown away by seeing like stats on the sdf1 and all of all of this stuff and to me i was just like oh my gosh he did like you say you counted every little missile you can see that you counted like every gun emplacement and every like porthole and every single little thing and I mean, that must have just been excruciating, but also it sounds like for you a, a great deal of fun and brought you maybe a lot of joy and, and it, enter, you know. It, it was. So, so one of the things I hated when I see other people adapt one work from one medium to the next medium is when they would change it a lot um, or, or make, it, make it theirs. I hate it. Yeah, we made it ours. And it's like, but I don't want yours. I want what I know and love. So both with, with Turtles and Robotech, we tried to be as loyal to the market as we could. And we knew as, as and it's funny, I mean, at the time, the term was Japanimation. As fans of Japanimation. I remember um, that, yeah. It was so hard to get. Um, we... Uh, we knew what we wanted as fans. We wanted these kind of details. We wanted this kind of information. Um, and then we, we knew as fans what we wanted to be able to play these things. And, and then you have to sit down from a game design point of view. You look at the world. You, you figure out the story you want to tell, the characters you want in the world. And, and then you devise the rules that make it really work, that, that bring it to life. 
uh, and of course, fluff in the setting and the adventures and that kind of thing too. But you, you know, you kind of have to make it 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 fit the property, and, and that can be tricky at times. Um, we, uh, you know, it's funny. Sometimes a book comes together really quick, and other times it, it takes months or even years. I, I spent three and a half years on riffs. Uh, really, the original game system, Palladium game system. Um, by the time Palladium Fantasy was fine-tuned and saw print, I had done that for three and a half years. Um, and yet Robotech, you know, I probably spent, you know, two, three months doing the research, you know, the missile count of this to that. And then in watching the, the shows over and over and over again, um, so you get a feel of what they should be able to perform, how they should perform, um, what the speeds and stuff are. Um, you know, what that translates into, um, and then how the mechanics fit all that. Uh, but uh, the actual writing of the book took me uh, about three or four weeks. I mean, once I was ready to write it, it just poured out on me. Um, you know, Turtles was a similar thing where uh, I had been talking to Eric about what I had seen for, for Ninja Turtles uh, and Other Strangeness. The Other Strangeness part was important because this wasn't just about Team and T. Yeah, you, you know, kind of a- you kind of naturally like what's funny is you mentioned uh, making how you didn't like it when people sometimes made it their own. What's interesting to me about Ninja Turtles and about Robotech is that you very subtly actually I think you kind of did make it your own, but you kept to the look and feel and spirit of it. So it was so well kind of expanded that you don't even, the, the, the line between what is yours and what is, is true canon is very blurry and it feels very natural. And that's how like the way that you do, I'm thinking specifically of like the mutant animals and, and things like that. And the way that you can kind of, it has the look and feel of Ninja Turtles and other strangeness, right? And there's, there's it, you, you take that to a great level, yeah. I think, honestly. Well, and some of the stuff in the original Robotech, the problem was we, we didn't have stats and stuff. And we could, the translations would give us, you know, the size of the various mecha and stuff, but we, we didn't know what kind of missiles and, and all this stuff. And it's it's funny how many golden graces the, the origins of, of, of Robotech now uh, in the Macross, you know, source material but, but in 1985, 1986, 87, they, they did not. So Carl Masick was the guy who was working with originally for, for approvals. That's right. Yeah. Carl, for those of you who don't know, is yep. the guy who created Robotech. And Robotech is, is interesting in that it's basically three separate anime shows because Robotech was syndicated. And in those days, to syndicate a show, you needed 62 or 64 episodes. Macross, the most famous part of Robotech, it was only like like I want to say it's thirty two. Yeah, I think it's thirty six. Maybe I might be wrong, but something yeah. like that. Yeah, it was too short. Yeah. Too short. And, and so they needed to pad it out. And, and again, necessity to mother of invention, they took these two other animes, Southern Cross and Mospita, and that's where the idea of you know, the next generation and the next generation, which made the story much, story much more epic uh, and, and sprawling and it introduced, you know, new bad guys uh, in, in each each new generation. Uh, it, it made Robotech, you know, a bigger and more unique story than Macross. And that's no slam on Macross. I love Macross. Um, and, and for fans who prefer Macross, that's, that's cool. But you know, there's, there is some magic of Robotech. Carl Masick hit magic of Robotech. I, I agree. And this actually reminds me of something you had mentioned before. So um, what I noticed here is that you mentioned the fact that, you know, they took... So as Kevin says, they took uh, Macross, uh, uh, Southern Cross, and Mos Pieta, and they combined them into this long, big series. And what that kind of does is something that he was talking about before which is like consequences. So he mentioned earlier on, when you do something, something is gonna happen later on. 
And what's interesting to me, and maybe what sort of appealed to you about the show, or maybe why you were such a natural fit for adapting it, is because there are essentially three different generations. Each one is like the result of what happened, of what has come before. And so I can kind of see that, um, and I kind of wanted to talk about this in basically in all of your work. Like you have different versions of what's happening in one part of the Rift's world versus another part of the Rift's world. And I think that's all a very natural fit for, that's the, to me, like the palladium kind of feel is looking at one thing from 15 different angles um, and looking at the earth from 15 different angles, say in this grand war or looking at it from the, you know, the, uh, the coming of the Rift's, looking at it from, uh, you, you know, Heroes Unlimited, where we have all these different like powers and things like that kind of all crashing together. And that conflict creates, it creates potential for your players, for the people that pick it up, who might not, who, who might be 11 years old and might not totally understand like how to form a drama. But we have like the coalition, we have, you know, like a, a, a different factions within the, the Rift's world, and you almost naturally end up smashing them together, and that creates the drama and the conflict. So I've kind of gone off on a tangent. But I just meant to say that the idea of these three generations within Robotech, it sort of makes me think, ah, that might be why it might have appealed or might have like fit so well with Palladium. So, uh, sure, maybe. Um, part of it is, like I said, we 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 loved it, and um, we knew we knew both Turtles and Robotech. If we did it right, we knew it it would get us into comic book stores, and that would open up a whole new market for us, and and, and it did. Um, and uh, and it was a blast to do because we, we loved those properties. So it was just just you pure fun and. You can and see in it Robotech, and some of the stuff, the early stuff that seems like like some people have gone back and said, "Oh, a lot of the stuff was wrong." You know, we had to do what what Harmony Gold wanted us to do, and some of it there were just big holes. Like we created this whole Russian faction in in Southern Cross because we had no idea That's what right. it yeah. was, yeah. And, and and neither did Harmony Gold. Right, um, that, that so makes sense. They just let us make stuff up. Yeah, and, and I, in some of the stuff. <clears throat> Carl, like I said, in the early days, I think Carl saw Robotech very much as his and that it wasn't Macross or these other shows. He had turned it into something else. So the, the one conversation, I'm going through these things and I go, well, our Japanese translations say these are particle game cans. And he's like, no, those are, you can tell he's making it up right there. No, those are auto cannons. Well, and Carl, these are plasma guns. Right. No, no, those are lasers. And 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 well, these lasers. No, th those are plasma weapons. And I'm like, I go, but Carl, our Japanese translations. And I said that to such a point where he's like, I don't give an f what the Japanese translations say. I'm telling you what it is. And I'm like, okay. You, yes, you got it, sir. Dude. Yes, sir. Well. Let me let me ask you this because we're um, so I want to remind everybody that I usually actually do like an hour long episode, but I kind of knew. Oh shoot! Sure. And, and really Kevin well. had uh, yeah, I know, right? But um, Kevin well, has warned have me. me back. I know. Well, that's 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 it. And but I want to ask you at least. So I figured we'd do like a special double sized episode um, of a couple hours, but we're coming up on the the final quarter of our two hours. I I would not want to forget about asking you a little bit about the actual system so uh the system itself and i just wanted to kind of know um i know that the the legend is that of course it's it's uh you patching things together and then sort of like creating your own system gradually and slowly over time how did you kind of settle on this system and and can you tell us a little bit about the way it developed and and what your thoughts and theories behind it were yeah, um, I think Eric and I, uh, so, so we're very passionate about storytelling and, and game design, Eric, especially uh, game theory. And both of us at the time, we wanted games that were more, more intuitive and, and played faster and focused more on character and story. Uh, and, and, for, and again, it's not obvious because I had to start out slow because of my finances, but 
I wanted to do a game system that could incorporate fantasy, science fiction, horror, the whole nine yards f- from the very beginning. Um, you know, as I mentioned, even in the Palladium of Desires, we had all those different elements. I mean, in, in one of the very first adventures, um, Julius's character, Zarkzar the wizard, um, finds this weird item in it and inscribed in it is, it says, to Luke from bed. And, and you know, Julius, the player is like, is this what I think it is? And, I, and sure enough, it was a lightsaber. And, you know, we were combining those elements all the time because I love the flexibility of role playing and the possibilities that that role playing offers. And so I wanted to create a game system that would allow all those things. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, the game system kind of developed organically. And you can see that. That's why it's only, as you mentioned earlier, it's only like 90%. If you learn one of our games, you can play all of our games, but they're all a little different. Um, even some of the same skills and, and uh, powers might be a little different from one game setting to another because, you know, I fine tuned it later or I got a new idea for it later. Um, you know, we would kind of add rules like, like CJ Corella came up with perception rules um, in Nightbane. And then over time, I started to include perception rules more and more. And in fact, in recent books, they're all over the place, although they're kind of different than the way um, CJ originally intended. Um, but, but they're cool. So, so yeah, and, and I wanted to simulate, I, I, I always love it. And I also kind of laugh inside when people say, you know what I love about your game system, Kev? It's so realistic because there's nothing realistic about you don't feel that role playing is it's it's you, you know but it's it feels plausible and it feels realistic and, and, and it, it works and that's what i wanted you know when you're doing game design in a lot of ways it, it's simulation and you, you with rules and dice um and you want something that um well there's a lot of things you might want every every game designer has their own kind of outlook on things like like eric over time wanted to go totally freeform and and which is why he came out with amber dice amber right yeah um and and i I think it's a great concept it's not my cup of tea um i uh i feel like i want a certain amount of structure because because i think a game like Amber Diceless, uh, and you touched upon it, Matt, earlier, where a good game master can make any game great. Uh, I learned that early on at the gaming center. There's this one game master who this guy was like renowned as being the best game master, one of the best game masters a- at the gaming center. And, and part of his fame was he could take the worst piece of crap source book or, or adventure book and, and turn it into pure gold. But the bizarre thing about him was he couldn't create stuff from scratch. He needed that foundation. He could take something, even that foundation was weak and right. wobbly and terrible or falling apart, he could spit into gold. He needed that structure that, that, that at the beginning for him to elaborate on. So my problem with Amber Dyson was a game that's more subjective like that a great answer like Woodjick could spin fantastic games. Right. And so could it was the right system masters. for him. But guys who were not so astute, you know, they would have trouble with it or would get overpowered or, you know, unbalanced. Um, you know, and that's where I like the role of the dice. I mean, and I like the thrill of the dice. I mean, just yeah, like, yeah. you know, at a gambling table and you're shooting craps, you know, yeah. you hit that number that you need. There's that adrenaline rush. I, I mean, right. I'm sure everyone right. who's exactly. working has exactly. had those moments where a guy rolls a natural 20 and the whole group loops up and cheers because, you know, he, he just got the bad guy. That's um, actually a really, shot. that's a really in 
that's a really interesting point. So I have experimented with all kinds of systems. I've played all kinds of systems, and um, I tend to go a little bit more towards, uh, well, okay, that's not true. I, I just run the spectrum. And one thing that you just sort of mentioned was that idea of like everyone jumping up all at once and like on that roll of a 20. And that's actually something that I had never quite, I considered what was happening, but I never considered it within the framework of like from a design perspective and whether or not you're playing a diceless game or, or a, a, a dice heavy game or something in between. When that random thing hits and it rolls and then you get you squeak by with like a few bonus points from like whatever skill or whatever it is you happen to have, everyone jumps up and cheers. Whereas, and again, it depends on your style, but whereas a game without that kind of mechanic where the GM says it it happens, you know, right. if I were to randomly kind of just arbitrarily think in my head, I wonder which one gets garners a, a greater reaction. You're you're right. I, I would bet 100 percent on that dice roll getting a huge reaction because it's up to the gods of role playing to, like, tell us whether they're looking favor favorably on you right. that day or not. Well, and because you're the guy who rolled it. You like you, you did it. it. You, and, you and you did, but, but did you? I mean, but it feels like you did. It's just the luck of the roll. Right. But you did it. And when you roll three 20s in a row, that is the gods, the gaming gods looking down. They on are you. smiling on you. Yeah. Well, Kevin, there's one thing I want to do here because I, I think this is important. So I've been singing your praises through the entire program. And I think everybody's thinking that somehow you're writing me a check for this or whatever. But it's, again, I'll just say that I pick my stuff based or pick my guests based on what I have on my shelves. But what I want to say about this is I've been watching the chat the whole time. And yes, chatters, I have been watching you. And what I am kind of like excited by when I see this is, first of all, there's a ton of chatter going on. So I want to thank everybody, even though I might not have mentioned anyone here, and I'm so sorry for that. I'm just not the best like multitasker. I have been keeping an eye on it. Um, people are so supportive and they're so excited about your games and they're talking back and forth. They're, they're like, you know, they're basically kind of like chat wise, keyboardingly high fiving you on many of your comments. Um, and they're saying things like, you know, this is a certain book that got me into gaming. Uh, I love the Red Borg. I like uh, the, the beautiful artwork. Um, it's very clear from looking through this chat how many others you've kind of inspired. I don't know if these are people that are my age. I don't know if they're younger. I don't know if they're older. Um, but it's fairly clear that you have really inspired a lot of people. And I just want to say to the chatters out there, I, I, I think it's really a great thing. As a teacher, I hope that like bringing guests like Kevin on like inspires you to kind of talk to each other and maybe meet each other. And I'm sure you're probably friends like on Facebook groups or like on Reddit pages or, or whatever. But it's so good to see all of you out there like kind of chatting it up and getting really like excited. I mean, the number of times, I wish I had a nickel for every time I love riffs what, or like riffs is the best or whatever showed up in the chat. Um, it's pretty clear that people love what you've created, Kevin, and it has had a huge influence. <laughs> we have people chanting Eastern Bloc of Soviet independent states uh, out there, which is, a very interesting thing I never thought I'd see in a chat, but I get it. I, I get you. I got you covered. Uh, I totally get that. Um, people are really enthusiastic uh, about what you've created. And I think that, you know, I, I just want to know, when are the movies or the Netflix show coming for Riffs? Oh, man, we've been, Come uh, on. we have been working on that so hard for, for like 20 freaking years um you know we had that disney it's film. a natural it's a natural and, and, and it is and, and that the problem i think part of the problem is hollywood is so risk adverse which is why you're seeing them making games based on monopoly and battleship because they sit back right. and go well gosh 20 gazillion games of these have sold so all these people know it and love it and, and again it doesn't necessarily translate 
to that that medium yes they love monopoly of the game but do you want to see monopoly of the movie uh, i guess we'll find out because they're making one yeah um but you know they didn't go see battleship for obvious reasons and um you know it's so the problem is not that people look at our games and our worlds and our settings and our characters and don't go wow these are really cool because we had lots of people look at them and say wow these are really cool when jerry bruckheimer had disney get secured of the rights for him uh when i met with bruckheimer he's like kevin i see riffs as my star wars and i'm like that's good because it's it's my star wars the problem is having them understand what story to tell so role playing unlike a novel or a comic book it's a world setting there's not necessarily a specific story so it makes it hard for them to wrap their head around and the fact they well you can tell especially with riffs any story that's not helpful um and then the other problem is the bean counters the guys who hold the purse strings they look at this and go this is some stupid game from some little niche market that you know was huge in the 90s and is not as huge now and you know do we really want to take a risk on something like this um so it, it's it's tricky um you know we'd also like to do video games that could be another really cool market to do but they're big like hollywood and have a lot of the same considerations um yeah you know we're hoping to breathe some some new heat into riffs over the next few years that maybe creates some energy and gets people going um there's been a number of people who have contacted me over the years um joe manganello uh, ross and marshall thurber um uh, uh peyton who did uh um uh, i can't think of his name but uh a bunch of guys have reached out yeah, there's a whole generation of Hollywood people that are that are out there making films and TV shows that I know, we all know, were that guy in high school or that even that girl in high school that was playing riffs and and playing, you know, ninjas and super spies and beyond the supernatural and and all of that stuff. We totally know that. And I I think it's only a matter of of time. I know that what's funny Hope is it's that, in my life I yeah I I I have a funny feeling because I I just think that with streaming getting to be what it is and the amount of unfortunately it's just called content now but with the the demand for content um there are a lot of cool things that pop up out of it like there's there's a lot more stuff and I think you're right I mean I see because when you look at riffs you I mean all, for those of you that don't know like all the books on the back there I'm, I'm pretty sure those must be like mostly riffs books but like there's a oh, huge yeah, a lot, a lot. world yep. and so it might be kind of hard to say well how do we whittle this down to two maybe two and a half or three hours but I think the obviously the potentials there and the truth be told there are millions and millions of hours worth of riffs movies and palladium movies in the heads and the hearts and minds of all of us that have been playing it for decades now and and if that's all i ever get well okay i'm very happy with that because it created some wonderful experiences for me and and i think you know i i think everyone's been saying it in the chat now they're all like oh my goodness like thank you very much kevin thank you there there's a lot of that in there um and and I want to say it, you know, on behalf of everybody that's been chatting in the in the chat, and on behalf of myself and and five or six of my very good best friends, life friends, um, thank you so much for for your creations. They've inspired me, and they've they've moved me, and and they've like you know energized me, and and I feel like I was part of something like really exciting. I am part of something really exciting. Like every week or two. When I play a game, or when I when I pick up, you know, and I start reading about Aaron Tarn, or or like Triax, or whatever, um, and for that, I just wanted to thank you for for that. Um, so, Kevin. Well, you're very, very, very welcome, and, and I, I do want to say that um, Palladium has has the greatest fans in the world. I, I truly believe that we're we're really like a family. Anyone who's been at a Palladium open house 
knows that it's like a more like a big party celebration than, than a convention. Um, it's, uh, I don't know. I, I, seriously, the fan base is, is amazing. Um, I, I feel close to everybody. People will pop into the office from time to time and they're always thrilled when I give them a quick little tour of the office and, uh, you know, take 20 minutes to speak with them. And, you know, and it's like, hey, fellow gamers we're into this stuff we we love this stuff you know it's you know we're, we're part of a big family and that's i have to say of all the things that I, i've done that's the really beautiful part and, and humbling part is I, I i never really especially in the early days i was so focused on getting out my worlds and my stories i i never really thought about how they would impact people and inspire other people um like i mentioned joe manganello and ross and marshall thurber a couple of famous guys but i mean you know joe played D, &D turtles and riffs those are his big favorite games um uh ross and marshall thurber wrote one of the screenplays for uh jerry bruckheimer films um that that didn't get produced but um, and, and both of those guys said they're, they're actors or writer directors because my games inspired them and showed them that they were storytellers and that they wanted to tell stories in some way, shape or form. And to me, holy crap, that's, that's just astonishing. And, and um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably what I'm most proud of, of everything is that my work has inspired other people um, in a lot of different mediums, just like the works of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and Jim Strang. Absolutely. Absolutely. Me, so. 100%. I, I totally believe that. Well, Kevin, thank you very much uh, for coming on. Uh, for the viewers out there, thank you so much for watching. Um, I have a funny feeling I'm going to wrestle and negotiate to get Kevin back on like at a later date, because if you don't, you haven't seen the amount of questions I sent to him, I've, I've asked him about half of maybe what I wanted to talk about. Uh, I will definitely try and get him back for a deeper dive on, on a few certain subjects that I think are well worth exploring. I'd be happy to. Thank happy you. To do it. Thank you so much, Kevin. And to all of you watching out there, thank you very much again. Uh, if you like what you saw and if you want to help support me, bring you creators like Kevin, uh, please do like and, and subscribe. Uh, if anything else, I can tell my mom, like I've got a certain number of subscribers and that in me, that, that makes me a winner to, to mom. Um, so thank you all very much. Role Player with a Thousand Faces will return. And to each of you out there, have a great game.